When you think of Native Americans, what's the first image that pops into your mind? Is it a teepee, a lone man riding across the prairie? Is it the Native Americans that helped the pilgrims on that first Thanksgiving? While all of those are valid visions, there's so much more to be celebrated in Native American history and culture. Come along with me as we visit the Denver Museum of Nature and Sciences North American Indian Cultures exhibit on a virtual field trip to learn more about the diverse tribes and cultures of North America. Before European settlers came to North America, tribes of Native Americans were settled all across the U.S. and Canada. And while we often think of Native Americans riding their horses across the American plains, that's only a tiny portion of the story. Generally, historians divide North American tribes into 10 groups or cultural regions. Each of these groups had their own traditions, clothes, homes, art, and more. The life of any two tribes might be as different as the lives of a farmer from Iowa and a fisherman from Florida. Let's dig into some of the groups and see what we learn. The first area the exhibit looks at is the Northwest Coast. Tribes in this area include the Puyallup, Skokomish, and Yakima tribes. Probably the most recognizable symbol of Northwest Coast Native Americans is the totem pole. Totem poles tell about family, heritage, histories, and more. Poles aren't only to keep records, totem poles have a lot of different jobs. Some poles helped support plank houses, which were long houses made of cedar planks that could hold many different families in a tribe. Look at this huge canoe. Because the Pacific coast has so many waterways and islands, canoes were the main form of transportation for many people. These canoes were usually made of cedar and dug out to form that canoe shape. One important tradition of the Northwest coast was and continues to be the potlatch. Potlatch is a Kakwala word that literally means to give in English. In the past, these were huge gatherings of many tribes. It was a time to get together and celebrate, meet friends, eat, dance, give gifts. It was such an important part of tribal culture. In 1883, potlatches were banned in Canada because government leaders thought it was preventing the tribes from becoming civilized. Imagine if the government banned Christmas. What would that feel like? It would be confusing. It might make you angry. You would wonder where things had gone wrong. You might decide to celebrate Christmas anyway. Many Native Americans did, and they were arrested. The ban was lifted in 1951, but people were still nervous to celebrate. It took years for people to become comfortable with the idea of potlatch again. Our field trip is going to move on to the Great Basin Cultural Region. The Great Basin region covered parts of what's Utah, Nevada, Idaho, and more. It had the Rocky Mountains as its eastern border, the Sierra Nevadas as the western border, and plateaus to the north and south. Tribes included the Shoshone, the Ute, the Paiute. A symbol of the Great Basin region that you'll probably recognize are their beautiful baskets. They often coated the insides of the baskets with pitch, a product they made from pine sap. You know, the sticky stuff from pine trees? That makes the basket waterproof. So baskets could be used to haul things like seeds as well as holding and storing water. Different tribes wove different designs into their baskets. Great Basin tribes were nomadic, which means they moved to different hunting grounds throughout the year. In the winter, as their migration slowed, they lived in shelters called wikiups. They were rounded structures made by bending tall saplings or baby trees together and connecting them at the top. They were usually about 15, 20 feet across and covered in mats of rushes or bark to keep families warm during that cold winter. One important tradition of Great Basin tribes was the annual rabbit drive. Many tribes came together in the late fall to harvest rabbits for the winter. Hunters would walk down a valley driving rabbits into huge, like sometimes they were almost a mile long, nets. The rabbits would then be stored for winter food and their hides would be made into blankets. Now we're moving on to the Southwest Cultural Region. This region centers around present day Southern Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, the Four Corners region. The tribes include the Navajo, the Pueblo, and others. 
When you think of the Southwest cultural region, you might think of the massive Pueblo dwellings in places like Mesa Verde and across the Southwest. These were lived in by various tribes from the Southwest region. Members of the Navajo tribe didn't live in those Pueblos they traditionally lived in Hogan's. Hogan's were originally made of leaning posts covered in dirt and mud. And as the railroads reached Navajo land, they increasingly were made of discarded railroad ties. Today, some Navajos still live in Hogan's. Some are made in the traditional way and some are made with modern building materials. You might also recognize the beautiful Kachina dolls made by the Hopi and Navajo tribes. These dolls were carved of cottonwood root and were given to girls and young women as part of their religious teachings. You can still find kachinas being manufactured today, although modern techniques and tools have made them more elaborate than those in the past. See this mask? It was used as a part of an Easter ceremony. This is a ceremony that blends both ancient tribal beliefs and Catholic beliefs introduced by Spanish missionaries. The ceremonies are still held today and are an important celebration. Let's move on to the Plains cultural region. The Plains cultural region stretched from the Rocky Mountains to the Mississippi River and north into modern day Canada, south to Mexico. It was a huge stretch of land. Some tribes that are part of the Plains cultural region include the Cheyenne, the Sioux, Blackfoot, Crow, and more. When we think of Native Americans of the past riding across that vast plains hunting buffalo, the Plains cultural region is what we're thinking of. Plains tribes were nomadic, which means they moved around, following buffalo herds for hunting. They lived in teepees, which were a great fit for their nomadic lifestyle. Teepees are a series of poles spread out at the bottom and connected at the top in a kind of a cone shape. They were then covered in tanned animal hides like buffalo and deer skin. These teepees were easy to break down and transport across the plains as tribes moved. Native Americans of the plains were the first indigenous people of the US to use horses extensively. Horses aren't native to America, they were brought over by Spanish explorers. As those Spanish explorers moved north onto the plains, they brought their horses and plains Indians absolutely adopted them and became a horse nation. Plains tribes are well known even today for their beautiful beading. Women of the plains tribes would use beads to create intricate patterns on their family's clothing and household goods. Young girls would learn the craft from older relatives and still do today, passing down the art form from one generation to the next. One important tradition for Plains cultures is dancing. Dancers in fabulous beaded gear show off their footworks during gatherings, just like you might dance at a party. Just like the potlatch, these dances were banned for a time because the government felt that Native Americans shouldn't be able to practice their own traditional rites. In 1933, dances were again allowed and the modern powwow evolved. Powwows still continue today all over the Plains region. Modern powwows can be huge events held in coliseums and event centers and hosting thousands of people from many different tribes. They're an important time for members of those different tribes to get together and celebrate their culture and community. Many powwows are open to the public. If you hear of one in your area, think about going to learn something new. We're moving on to the tribes of the Northeast region. These tribes include the Wampanoag tribe, the tribe that was part of that first Thanksgiving. This region includes current day New England, Canadian provinces like Quebec and Ontario into the Ohio River Basin. Tribes in that Northeast cultural region include the Iroquois, the Wampanoag, the Lenape, and more. Tribes of the Northeast region were a settled population. They were not nomadic. The Iroquois built huge longhouses the longhouses were built by creating a frame of saplings and then covering the frame in birch bark. These houses were about 20 feet wide and anywhere from 40 to 400 feet long. Many different families would live in each longhouse, kind of like an apartment complex. Just like the totem poles, beadwork, and kachina dolls created by Native Americans in other regions, Nor Native Americans of the Northeast cultural region have added to America's rich cultural heritage they created wampum beads out of shells in their region. These wampum were used as decoration for clothes, as identification, and as money. In fact, wampum was the first legal money in the original colonies. Did you know that? Wampum was also used as a way to identify people. 
the leaders of each tribe had a specific string of wampum that kind of served as like their ID badge. Wampum also told stories, special patterns held histories, and events for future generations to read. Today, wampum is still being created in that traditional way. There is a nation in New York that created a wampum factory that makes both traditional and modern wampum for use by Native artists. Our field trip is moving southeast. Let's head to the Southeast Cultural Region. This region includes the Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek, Seminole tribes, and more. These tribes lived in the areas of the current Southeast US, like Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, down in that Southeastern portion. Most Southeastern tribes were farming tribes. They grew corn, beans, squash, also things like sunflower, grapes, plums. They really used that fertile land to their advantage. And they used wild plants and game as food when they needed to. Houses in the southeastern cultural region varied quite a bit according to the needs of every group. Some homes were built on platforms with open sides and a thatched roof. Some homes were covered in thatch with only a door and smoke hole as openings, depended on what each tribe needed. The now infamous Trail of Tears affected these tribes, and they were forced by the government to leave their home and walk thousands of miles to Oklahoma. It's estimated that over 3,000 people died along the route. This forced migration explains why some of the tribes of the Southeast now have reservations in Oklahoma, an area far from the land of their ancestors. The final group we'll visit on our field trip is the Arctic Cultural Region. This region includes Northern Canada and coastal Alaska. Tribes include the Inuit, the Aleut, and the Yupik. These are tribes that have adapted to live in that cold, dark, snowy region of the Arctic. When we think of these tribes, we often think of igloos. But did you know that you and I both live in igloos? To the Inuit, the word igloo means any kind of home. So I live in an igloo, you live in an igloo, the President of the United States lives in an igloo. Igloo viguk is the word for snow house. I don't know about you, but I do not live in an igloo viguk. These tribes use driftwood framework and animal skins to make kayaks. These kayaks are different from canoes used in other regions because even the tops of the vessels are covered in skins. That's to protect the user from ice cold seawater. And they used seal bladders or even full seal bodies to help keep those kayaks afloat. Today, culture from the Arctic cultural region is being kept alive pretty well. Inuit language is still spoken in many parts of the region and can even be found on TV shows. Every other year, an Arctic Winter Games is held to celebrate and compete in those traditional Arctic sports. Think back to the beginning of this video when we were talking about imagining a lone man riding across the plains or the Wampanoag at that first Thanksgiving. See how much more there is to the story? And while we can honor that lone rider and those Thanksgiving guests, we also need to know the other pieces of the story. I hope you'll take some time, dig a little deeper, and learn a little more. If you want to go on more field trips, make sure to click the subscribe button and hit the notification bell. We take a different field trip every month, and if you have a specific field trip you'd like to see, let me know in the comments.